back to the channel. Reese the Sideliner as always. The first round as of today is officially over with. We had um, the first game of the second round be played um, between Denver and Minnesota last night and Cleveland and Orlando just wrapped up their seven game series um, where the home team won each game. So it was kind of expected seeing how the series that played out that Cleveland would win this series in game seven, seeing how it literally went 2-2, 1-1, and then obviously Cleveland getting this win today. Um, second round is officially set, so we have Boston taking on Cleveland now. Um, best of luck to them, honestly. Uh, obviously, we have Denver versus Minnesota going on at this current moment. Then, um, New York will be playing Indiana tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow evening, and um, OKC is taking on the Dallas Mavericks, who beat the Philadelphia Philadelphia, the Los Angeles Clippers in six. So uh, we got some good basketball coming up <sighs> for the Cavs, and we'll get into them after we speak about last night's game regarding the Timberwolves. But what I do want to say. Since we just looked at a bait, like a preview, I guess, of the matchups for the Cavs, I have a lot of concerns for them going up against the best team in a regular season. And uh, they just really struggled against the youngest team, the second youngest team in the playoffs next to OKC. So, uh, yeah, um, like I said, we're going to get into the Cavs after we talk about the Timberwolves, who had a... It was similar to this Cavs game, I'm not going to lie, where a majority of the damage that was done was by the star player, um, Anthony Edwards obviously being that guy for the Timberwolves. He had a hell of a game last night, hell of a game, and he is <laughs> he is one of the my favorite players in the entire league to watch, man. He has the bag in every every aspect of offense on the floor, whether he can he can he he can finish layups or dunk it over you at the rim with ease. His vertical is out of this world. Um, he also has the strength to finish through contact. His footwork in the mid in the mid range. His jumper in the mid range. Like his his oh my gosh, bro. Anthony Evers is so tough, bro. And then he also can knock down a few threes throughout the game. So. I really love watching Anthony Edwards play. Not only is he an offensive threat on all three levels, but his defense has improved so tremendously um, since he's been in the league. Obviously, he showed flashes of it at Georgia, but really taking on that two-way superstar kind of mode, especially in this playoffs, this young man is going to be a superstar for years and years to come he will be you can market him as the face of the league i know i've been saying it's, it's going to be wimby because of just the potential that has been built off of his rookie season that he did have but um going back and watching gills arena um or having watched gills arena for quite a while now they had a segment on there where they were talking about face of the league and for this to be an American, this is supposed to be um, an American league dominated by American players, essentially. That's what the NBA is supposed to be, or that's what it's looked at to be. Um, do you really want a, a foreign-born player to be the face of the league? That's kind of up in the air, although the foreign-born players are, um, you know, they have a huge stake in the league right now. The past four MVPs have been foreign-born. If you go all the way back to Giannis and Dedekumpo, four, right? Well, it depends on who wins this one, but you know what I mean? Even if it's Shea, he's from Canada. If it's Luka, he's from Slovenia. So the past three to four MVPs would have been foreign-born players. So I don't know. You kind of do already have a face faces of the league that are foreign-born. Um, but Anthony Edwards could be that guy, the American-born player that is all, all, about bat, all about his team, all about winning, all about... Um, being himself, his personality is probably what gravitates people towards him the most. Obviously, his play is very, very uh, captivating, but his personality is the most 
authentic part that 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 shows his authenticity and that really it show his all his game is also authentic he doesn't try to force things that he's not accustomed to doing he's not going to play outside of his means he's a very controlled player for um him being only 22 years old like he's He's getting comparisons to Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant because of how well he has handled himself in this playoff run against a three-headed monster and Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker, and then coming in against the number one team or the, the reigning defending champions in the Denver Nuggets and just absolutely obliterating them on the offensive end. He, he's, he's tough, bro. He literally, he picked up right Picked off right off where he left from the last series. Extremely comfortable offensively. If you haven't been able to tell by um, how I've been exuding my excitement from watching him last night. He has 16 points on two two splashes and and one pull up. A couple of really easy lays at the rim in the first quarter. Everything looked like a shoot around, you know, basket for him. He was six of ten from the field while simultaneously playing great defense on Jamal Murray. He held him scoreless for the first quarter, going 0 of 4, who um, it ultimately turned into 0 of 5 for Murray, going scoreless for the entire half, the first time that's happened in his postseason career in about 57 or so games. Anthony Edwards was a major factor in that. Um, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> He had 25 of the 40 points of the Minnesota Timberwolves in the first half. He scored nine points in the second quarter, ended the half shooting 10 of 17. He only scored six points in that third quarter, but that's where Carl Anthony Towns got hot. Uh, Mike Conley started hitting shots, and Kill Alexander started hitting some shots as well. So he didn't really need to continue carrying a huge offensive load, but when it came down to it in that fourth quarter, he closed the game out with an array of shots from all over the floor, especially the mid-range, which just, that was the shot he was getting to all game. He hit the clutch free throws at the end of the game and just walked into the lane for an easy layup. Uh, on a fast break press, I mean on a full court press, um, where he saw literally all five defenders was in, within his vicinity at some point in time. He just walked in and got an easy lay to really secure this game. Like I said, he's such a joy to watch, bro. One of literally top five for me right now. It will have to be, um, obviously, Victor Wimiyama, number one. He's just otherworldly, bro. I, every time I watch Vic, it's, it's captivating. Seeing him in person really um, elevated that for me. So... Right now, Victor Wimayama is my number one favorite player to watch. Shea, obviously, will be number two for me. Anthony Edwards is probably number three. And then it will go, like, LeBron James. Um, uh, number Like, Kyrie Irving. But um, he's definitely in my top three, top five, Anthony Edwards is. I love seeing him play basketball. He's such an amazing player, bro. And he's only getting better. He had 43 points for the game, seven rebounds, three assists, a steal, and two blocks. 59% shooting for the game, 43% from three, 33 of seven for the game on uh, deep balls. Like I said, Mike Conley in that uh, third quarter started hitting some shots, but in that first half, he really struggled. Just two points in the entire half, one of four. He came alive, hit three uh, threes in that third quarter, 12 points total for the period. His spurt of scoring was really you know, just what they needed <clears throat> in that time, just what the doctor ordered. Not to mention, you know, with the rest of the team hitting shots, he's his facilitation is looking much better. They're not just uh, uh, empty passes, so to speak, just passing the ball into a missed shot, which a lot of what was happening for the Minnesota Timberwolves in that first half, they just couldn't get many shots to fall. But Mike Conley did end up with a double-double of 14 points and 10 assists when in that first half it looked like he was just going to be a non-factor for the game. And then, like I mentioned, Nas Reed for that fourth quarter. Um, well, I didn't mention that. I mentioned Towns in the third quarter. But Nas Reed, he caught a whoo, a much-needed burner for them, man. He scored 14 of his 16 points at the right time, picking right up off where a cat left in that third quarter. He scored 10 straight for Minnesota at one point in that quarter, led the charge of a 16-7 run to take a nine-point lead with just two minutes left in the game. His offense late was a crucial aspect in the win. Um, <clears throat> and like I mentioned, there were players – that just couldn't hit shots for the Timberwolves last night. Jaden McDaniels being one of them. He was 0 of 7 for the game after being such a steady scorer in that previous series against Phoenix where he averaged 15 or more a night. 
Um, it didn't hurt them too much though. He's always going to make up for it on the defensive end. He was, you know, that's where he lays his hat. That's where he's best at. He did had uh, eight rebounds for the game, three of them being offensive, which, you know, when you go back and look at the way that this game ended on a three possession game, those three offensive rebounds could have made a huge difference. So he still, you know, contributed in ways other than scoring the basketball. But guys, like I said, Nas Reed caught a burner. Mike Conley caught a burner. Like, they guys were just getting hot throughout this game that really, you know, helped Edwards uh, pound on the scoring. And I'll be, um, when I watch these games, I try to figure out who I think is like the X factor, so to speak. And it would have to be just a team effort of catching burners. like three different players caught fire at three different times and it was just too much for the Nuggets to handle at some point when their guys aren't making shots like Jamal Murray was still struggling in that third quarter Michael Porter Jr. started to struggle um, in that second half and then Jokic was getting pretty much locked down by Rudy Gobert and he's how they were matched up so that was much much needed every single one of those spurts offensively for those uh, for those guys on the offensive end now Carl Anthony Towns he got a foul on the jump ball. He fouled someone on the jump ball. Two seconds into the game, he picked up his first foul. Um, he was the only other, other other player not named Anthony Edwards to have more than one basket scored in the first half. Like, that's how, like like I said, Ant had 25 of their 40. Cat had nine of those. So the rest of the team had about six points, six, seven points. So it just wasn't looking too good for Minnesota. But they were only down four because of Jamal Murray's struggles, because Aaron Gordon wasn't uh, giving them much, because the bench wasn't able to score, which they are last in bench production over the entire uh, the entirety of the league in the postseason. So that's pretty much to be expected. Uh, Denver is. Um, but in that third quarter, like I mentioned, Towns caught fire. He began and uh, to begin right out of the half, he had a three um, three minutes into the third quarter he's at he matched his total for the first entire first half having nine points uh four of four um through a period of the uh third quarter and then had to leave for about six minutes came back right before uh, right for the last possession and then going into that fourth quarter he has 20 points after that's an 11 point quarter for carl Anthony towns you know what i mean so um the biggest thing about why he was struggling. He's he struggled so much to just play defense straight up without fouling all 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 playoffs long, and it, it it really puts them in a position to have to play uh, small ball at times. Yeah, Nas Reed is six nine, six ten ish, but he's not a guy that can bump and bang with Jokic. You don't want to have. Nas Reed guarding Jokic for more than 10 minutes a game because he's probably just going to eat. And that's why they had to pull Nas Reed late in that fourth quarter because Jokic was starting to get it going. They needed Towns, regardless of the four or five fouls that he did have, they needed Towns' body mass out there uh, to be able to bump and able to, you know, prevent Jokic from just getting easy baskets. Um, moving on to the Denver Nuggets side of things. Well, this was the first second round second this was the first win in a series that's gotten to the second round for Minnesota since 2004 so um, safe to say that their their trajectory whether this season ends this series or next series or what however this series made this um, season ends for Minnesota this was a historical historically great season for them and it's something that they can build off of moving forward for sure <clears throat> excuse me like i said Jokic, he was really unable to get anything consistently to go against gobert in that first quarter he held him to just one of five from the field the first half he finished with 15 points on 14 shots he did have five assists and four rebounds for either side, other than Anthony Edwards coming to play and dropping 25 in the first half, there wasn't really much to rave or, you know, really speak about because it was just such a a defensive game and a lot of misses as well for both sides that it was, you know, you don't I don't really have much note many notes to really speak on about what was going on in the first half, honestly. 
Um, but throughout the game, Jokic continued to struggle uh, to get much to fall, but he did nearly lead that comeback late in the game down the stretch in the fourth with some late game scoring. He finished the game with 32 points, eight rebounds, nine assists, three steals, but he did shoot 11 of 25 for the game, two of nine from three. When has Yoke, he led the game in three point attempts more than Michael Porter Jr., more than KCP, more than Jamal Murray. He shot the ball more than um, any player on the Minnesota Timberwolves. I don't ever recall a game where Jokic has led the game in three point attempts. That, that, I just, I don't know how to fathom that. It's not, he's not a shooter. He only hit two of them. He's taking nearly 10 threes in a playoff game. I mean, that just goes to show that the, the the defense that the Minnesota Timberwolves were playing on him, getting him out of the paint for a lot of those possessions. Um, and then when he was down low, you got a bang with one of the best defenders, most likely a four-time DPOY this year. And then Carl D. Towns, who has the muscle and body mass to you know prevent you from just getting bully ball buckets. So... That's how that one went. Um, after going down 18-4 to start the game, though, they were able to turn the tide and pull off a 13-0 run of their own. And that's really how they even got back into this game. Because, like I said, there were a lot of missed shots from both sides, especially Minnesota, though, during this stretch in the first quarter where they weren't able to drop any, you know, get anything to fall. 13-0 run, they were able to cut the lead to one. Um, and... They were they extended it to a 21 to three run going into the second quarter, uh, having a four point lead, which was their largest of the first half. I mean, of the first quarter, um, both teams, like I said, shot poorly, so it was a very low scoring second quarter. But guys like MPJ came through for them in the first half with 13 points, four of seven from the floor. He was the only player other than Jokic to score more than six points for the half. So there was. I don't know how many more times I can stress it. A lot of misses. A lot of misses. Uh, safe to say, though, his production was, you know, more than a saving grace in that moment. But in that second half, he couldn't get much of anything going. No production in that back end of the game. Just seven points, two of six shooting in the second half. He wasn't rebounding as well as we know he can at times. So this was just... This was just one of those games, you know what I mean? Jokic didn't have a double-double nor a triple-double, but he did, you know, have a solid game in scoring, but he wasn't shooting efficiently. Like I said, Jamal Murray went scoreless in the first half, hit just one shot in the second, uh, excuse me, took just one shot in the second quarter. Uh, the calf was more than likely causing him those troubles to where his mobility was limited. He wasn't able to explode the way he wanted to, but whatever. He knew he had to, you know, dig deep and find some other gear to, you know, lock into and activate in that second half. He scored seven points in the third quarter to try to get himself going. He carried over a bit of that scoring momentum into the fourth, dropping 10 points, keeping the fight a back and forth affair for a little bit, but ultimately fell short. Um, no production, like I said, from Aaron Gordon, really a non-factor in the game other than the highlight lob from Jokic. Uh, nine points on four of six from the field. Three rebounds, six assists, two steals. Obviously, he's not looked at to be um, a 20-plus point scorer a night. That's Jokic and Murray's job. Sometimes Porter. Porter's really the third option. But Aaron Gordon, we know, can be a second option scorer. Obviously, he was the first option scorer over in Orlando. So he, we, he, he, we know he has the capabilities. It's just the way that the offense is ran. Um with Denver, he's in a dunker spot, and then a lot of times with Towns having the Rudy, I mean, not the Rudy Gobert, but the uh, Nikola Jokic assignment, Gobert's sitting right there in that dunker spot waiting for Aaron Gordon to come over for the lob to deny that. So a lot of the game, he was just floating around. He was not able to get much going. So that was the story of that game. And then for Cleveland and Orlando, this was an ugly, ugly, ugly series offensively for both sides of this, uh, of how this goes, Cleveland and Orlando. It was really like a Donovan Mitchell, Paolo Mancaro duel, honestly. Like, and then this game really just uh, confirmed that Donovan Mitchell had eight points in the first quarter, was trying to carry the load offensively for Cleveland, 
with no one else able to provide any kind of help for him except for Karis LeVert on the last, you know, the little back end stretch of the uh, first quarter. He put up six points off the bench, but um, he finished, Donovan Mitchell finished the first half shooting just two of 11. So it was not looking good for him or the Cavs. They were down by 18 at one point in this game and down, I want to say nine or 10 at the half. So he got it going in that third quarter, uh, getting to the line consistently. He really, that really changed the game for him, able to reawaken his scoring, absolutely taking over in that third quarter. He scored 17 of Cleveland's 25 points for that quarter. Um, only seven points scored in the fourth, but guys like Max Strews came up huge. Um, Karis Avert kept being aggressive, although he only had two points in the second half. He just kept, I mean, in the uh, fourth quarter, he kept being, you know, an option. He's an available option if needed. He's, um, he has, uh, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on the name right now? Not Mobley. I said Max Struess, right? So I'm thinking about Max Struess, how his scoring, he's finally able to get something to fall in that third quarter. Uh, he had three threes. He finished the quarter with 11 points, which happened to be all of his points up to that point of the game. So something clicked for Cleveland coming out of that second half. They really dominated. Let me see if I can find the stat. They really dominated Orlando on, you know, that in that aspect of the game coming out of that second half um, for a total of 16 minutes we're going we're talking about going all the way back to four minutes and 48 seconds of the second quarter all the way through the end of the third quarter Cleveland outscored Orlando 47 to 21 and that was really that just absolutely wiped away that 18 to 20 point deficit that they were down a nearly 20 point deficit that they did that they did trail early on I don't know why I'm stuttering so hard right now um, it didn't look too promising for them, like I said, digging out of that hole that they did create. But coming into that second half, they really locked in on Paolo Bancaro, who went off and torched them for 24 points in that first half. Uh, they held him to just one of seven from the field, um, just two points in the quarter. So that was really the difference that they made, uh, stopping him from being the, you know, he was the only really consistent, constant threat offensively for Orlando the entire game. So taking him out, you know, making it to where he doesn't have the ability to get easy looks or um, able to, um, you know, get to the line as frequent as he was in that first half. That's what really made the difference for them in this one. Um, I really liked what I saw from Karis LeVert. Like I said, in that first half or so, he was the only player who uh, was a, const a constant, you know, threat to put the ball into the basket outside of Donovan Mitchell. Um, this, the second leading scorer for the Cavs off the bench opened the game with six points, uh, put pressure on the rim, causing the defense to foul him numerous times. He ended up finishing the game with 15 points, five rebounds, four assists, five of nine from the field, five or seven at the free throw. At the end of the game, he really played his um, he really played his role to a T, um, coming off the bench and able to be the spark scoring or grab, go and grab you critical rebounds, get some you know timely assists as well as playing some uh, pretty decent defense on the back end. So uh, Karis Avert, he's, he's going to be critical for them. We'll see what he does for them in this Boston series. Um, but uh, the guy that really, you know, just has my brain kind of in a whirlwind of how he's going to, you know, fare against the best backcourt, in my opinion, in the entire NBA, in the Boston Celtics of Drew Holiday and Derek White, is Darius Garland. He had been a disappointment all series long as far as, you know, you think about how great of a scorer he, he we know he can be. Um, just 15 points a game as the number two option on, in, in the playoffs is not good, especially taking on, like I said, the best team in the NBA of the Boston Celtics. That's not, that is not going to win you or get you close to even having a chance to compete with that team. It's just not going to get it done. Um, and they were the best team by a mile, by a mile. And, you know, down the stretch of the fourth quarter, whether on offense or defense, he did make, you know, key plays, timely shots, able to get some steals in the right moments to really turn the tide and help Cleveland make that run to finish off the game. But, um, you know, as far as it, 
his shooting goes, he hasn't been consistent pretty much all series. He finished the game off with just 12 points on three of 13 shooting, one of four from deep. His only shot that he hit from deep was the most important one, so we'll take it. Uh, three rebounds, four assists, three steals as well. So like I said, on the defensive end, especially late in that fourth quarter, he did his thing. But um, if he struggled this much against his young Magic backcourt, I can only pray for what this man is about to experience taking on Drew Holiday and Derek White for an entire four to seven games. Uh, who knows how long that one will last. So best of luck to him. This is, um, excuse me, this will be Cleveland's first playoff series win without LeBron James since the year of 1993. That's six years um, before I was even born. My parents were 12 years old. <laughs> um, this is the largest uh, Game 7 comeback win since 1998. So they did, um, they went out there and made a little bit of history, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, at what at what cost? You know what I mean? Boston is y'all waiting. Boston been waiting for y'all for the past two games now. Um, but for Orlando Magic, Paolo Bancaro, Paolo Paolo Bancaro. I don't know if he's my t he's in my top ten. He is also he is one of my favorite players to watch. With the frame that he has of a 6'9", 220, 230, whatever, how much he weighs. And the way that he's able to move and also get shots off in the mid-range. I know a lot of people have compared his game to LeBron James in the way that he's able to get downhill and attack uh, the rim and, you know, throw down some ferocious uh, dunks. And by all means, I've seen, you know, a couple plays that look very similar to flashes of young LeBron James. But when I watch Paolo Bencaro, there's one player I see constantly in his game, and I don't know if it's intentional or it's just because of the similar frames and similar play style outside of the three-point shooting. I see Carmelo Anthony in this dude's game, bro, and I love it. I love it, the way 6'9", able to shoot the mid-range shot, fadeaways, off of the back shoulder, off of a step back. If y'all can't tell, I don't know if y'all have watched a couple basketball videos that I have put out in my IRL hooping. Mid-range is where I thrive. That is my most favorite shot, not only to shoot, but to watch go into the rim. By, by far, by any kind of basket, it can be a full court heave that swishes so clean. It does not top a mid-range jumper for me. Mid-range work is some of the most exquisitely like it's in a different category when it comes to bag and footwork type of talk i love watching people get off in the mid-range balls anthony edwards who i mentioned earlier is one of the greatest at that at this current moment in this postseason shea gilgis alexander who we're still waiting to see um after sweeping the uh, pelicans feel like a week ago one of the best in the mid-range in this postseason. He's taking on Luka and Kyrie, two of the most lethal mid-range shooters in the postseason. Um, who else do we got? Paolo Bancaro. He looked very, very good all series for me in the mid-range. So, although he's eliminated, I, I love watching Paolo. For this game, damn, that was weird. For this game, he had 10 points in the first quarter. He scored or assisted on 16 of the 18 points halfway through the quarter. He checked back into the game in the second and helped extend the lead to 13 on a 7-0 run to open up the period. He got locked down in that second half, like I said, just one of seven from the field in that third quarter, but he didn't let up, he didn't hang his head, he kept going, he kept the aggression up, and he eventually was able to continue to get to the line and you know, really put some points on the board. Um, he was, not to mention, working the glass, you know, Leading, tying Evan Mobley for uh, 16 rebounds, uh, most in the game. So when they needed him the most, he was, you know, he was there and was trying to, you know, carry the team all game. It's just he can't do it alone. And this is his first. He's essentially a playoff rookie. That this is his first series. He's a playoff rookie. So it's you're gonna have you're gonna have these, you know, dry spells of where 
the defense is making it so hard for you, but you're still trying to kind of force to get your shot off, that's going to happen from time to time. But all in all, I still felt like he had a great game, a great series, battling Donovan Mitchell, like I said, all the way to the end of this one. 38 points, 16 rebounds, two assists, three steals, a block. He shot 10 of 28 from the field, but was lights out at the line going 15 of 18 for the game. Um, Three-point shooting early in this game was a big story. The big story for the Orlando Magic, uh, four of seven from range, propelling them on a 9-0 run with three straight possessions of threes in that first quarter. That really uh, got it going for them. But throughout the rest of that game, the, the, it, it just really wasn't there for them as far as three-point shots go. But they are, uh, I want to say, top three in the league when it comes to paint scoring. So that's really where they got most of their work in. Just stick to the stick to what y'all know. For, them, for the majority of the series, that's what was working for them. Um, in that second half, though, like I said, the Cavs locked in on Paolo, but not only Paolo, but Franz Wagner and Jalen Suggs also had struggle games. In that second half, they were combined, I want to say, four for 26, something like that. And the offense absolutely just crumbled. Nine of 35 from the field at, with 32 points, compared to Cleveland's 51 points, 17 of 32 from the field with six minutes left in the series. And that can kind of tell you how the rest of the game went. Like I said, they got outscored 47 to 21 uh, for a 16 minute stretch in this one. Um, and then like I mentioned, Franz and Jalen struggled, but Franz was essentially a ghost out there. Like I mentioned about Paolo being playoff rookies, you're gonna have those games, those stretches, but in the most important game of your young career, you gotta give them something. And he gave them, you know, he didn't provide much of anything for the game, most notably on offense. He shot one of 15. Six points for the game with the season on the line. He was he was just a no-show. Uh, they could have used something. Like I said, they lost by just 12. Imagine how he gave them giving them another eight points. That's a four-point game right there. Somebody, you know, then we got a different outcome. Maybe we're talking about this game differently. Who knows? And then Jalen Suggs, like I said, not not non-productive as well. Two of 13 shooting. Two of 10 from three. But he did give them a boost on the boards, being uh, second for the entire game with nine. And, you know, on defense, he's also going to give you those um, those possessions where he's just making it super tough for you, Darius Garland. That's why he struggled majority of the series, because Jalen Suggs did a hell of a job guarding him. Um, yeah, that's all I got, though, man. This video video's getting a little bit long. Um, and other than that, just just don't really have much else to talk about. Um, we could, yeah, I guess, preview going into uh, the second round, but there's one series that's already started, which we talked about in this video, OKC versus Dallas. Uh, we might get those in a separate video kind of thing. So uh, just stay tuned, as always. Um, tomorrow we do have OKC, not OKC, New York, and Indiana series kicking off, and then game two of this Denver and Minnesota series also. So. Yeah, stay tuned. I'm definitely coming to y'all with the videos. If you can't tell, we got the new Enjoy today. Or we got it yesterday. You know what I mean? Enjoy basketball. This is the spring collection. I think it's dope. Uh, yeah, appreciate y'all tuning in, man. I'll definitely catch y'all on the next one. Go ahead, subscribe, man. Road to 500. Peace.